Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth edition of the IFAD Innovation Talks. Today we're focusing on digital agriculture and the rural poor, challenges and opportunities in delivering results. We have a very special session today with a starring lineup of uh, panelists. Among them, 2019 Nobel Prize uh, winner in economics, uh, Professor Michael Kremer. We uh, also have the CEO of Precision Agriculture for Development, Owen Barder, and uh, many other uh, speakers that have joined us today. Because we have a really tight agenda today, I won't be able to introduce everybody as they, as they deserve. Uh, so uh, please uh, visit our event page. And um, in the event page, you will be able to see the speaker profiles, the concept note, and today's agenda. Before we start, I would like to navigate you through some tips so that we can run a smooth and successful event. Could you please check at the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A box and the chat box. The chat box uh, is available to all attendees and panelists. Please use it to introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining us from. And also to um, let us know if you're running into any, any technical problems. Um, the Q&A box, please uh, use it to post your questions, questions there and also to upvote any questions that you would like to have us addressed uh, as soon as possible. But, uh, use the icon, the thumbs up icon, so that um, we can uh, give priority to those questions that are favorite among, among all of you. Um, this is also a reminder that today's event is recorded. And uh, we are uh, very, very fortunate to be, run, to be running today's event in partnership with uh, Precision Agriculture for Development. Without much further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, speaker for the welcoming remarks, Michael Fankinecken, Associate Vice President of the Strategy and Knowledge Department at IFAT. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gladys. Um, dear friends, colleagues, partners, um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of IFAT to this fourth edition of the IFAT Innovation Talks. Today, as Gladys indicated, we focus on the challenges, but also importantly, the opportunities of digital agriculture. These innovation talks are a space for thought provoking discussions and to enrich knowledge and uh, we are very happy to have Nobel laureate in economics, Professor Michael Kramer with us. And I also would like to welcome Owen Barder, the CEO of Precision Agriculture for Development. A personal note, Owen Barder is also a great feminist who uh, fights against only having men in panels in conferences. And uh, I'm a big fan of that uh, side business of him as well. Uh, my colleague Nigel Bratz will introduce our panelists in a little while. The current pandemic has uh, exacerbated the existing challenges in food systems. The numbers, uh, the number of people facing acute food insecurity has gone up by over 100 million people in the 35 countries that WFP, the World Food Programme, works in. And we can um, expect that that's a multitude if we take all the countries in the world. The World Bank actually estimates that 150 million people have fallen back into extreme poverty um, due to COVID-19. This means that we're going backwards and losing years, probably decades of improvements and uh, progress in development. So raising agriculture productivity has a large impact on poverty reduction. And digital agriculture extension can provide smallholder farmers with timely and accurate information to be more productive and more profitable. Through digital innovation, we have a real chance at improving the lives of the billions of rural poor and their access to information and finance. We are aware of the challenges related to the introduction of technology and digitalization and the need to ensure that we develop local capacity and design the right incentives to scale up innovation, to not only increase technology, but to increase access, to increase adoption of technology by everybody. Digital extension services are less costly than traditional face-to-face -face services. However, I think it's really important to realize that this is not about cost cutting per se. Digital services can be more customized, more localized, can reach more people, 
and are easier to sustain over time. I think we have an opportunity to revolutionize agricultural service provision away from non-responsive sleepy systems that we've all seen when we traveled around the world in many countries. The good thing of COVID-19, and there's very few good things of COVID-19, is that we've learned a lot, even in fragile and conflict-affected areas, of how digital approaches can reach farmers, poor farmers, women farmers, youth farmers. We're preaching to the converted here in terms of agriculture and in terms of digital uh, agriculture. So there's no need to convince ourselves of the power of digital agriculture. I would like today to be, I'm especially interested in discussing the business models to scale up digital agricultural services. For me, this is no longer about boys and toys and nice apps. It is in many ways not even anymore about ICT. It's about empowering farmers, women and men, about setting up systems in the public sector and the private sectors that are institutional and financially sustainable. So welcome. I look forward to the keynote speeches by Michael Kramer and Owen Barber and to the panel dialogue. Really looking forward to it because, as I said, innovation talks are about collective wisdom, and I'm sure with all the great speakers and the great audience, bring that collective thinking forward and change our thinking into action. Back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Maike. Uh, now I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker for today's innovation talk, Professor Michael Kramer, co-founder and board member of uh, Precision Agriculture for Development and 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor Kramer, the floor, is you, the, floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, with COVID-19 and climate change, we're currently in the midst of an unprecedented environmental, social, health, and economic crisis. Historically, crises have spurred technological change and sometimes led to the adoption of new systems with long-lasting effects. You know, we're now holding a meeting over Zoom. We regularly do that. And that may not just affect things during the pandemic, but may affect things how we do, how we do things in the future. Um, you know, similarly, uh, there may be opportunities for changes in agriculture. For example, it may be valuable to adopt digital approaches to deliver services such as agricultural extension, not only now during the pandemic, but on an ongoing basis. During the pandemic, many governments and international institutions have shown increased interest in complementing overburdened in-person agricultural extension uh, services with digital services. Um, and I think there's tremendous potential for this to address long-term as well as short-term challenges. There are currently over 1 million agricultural extension workers worldwide, but there are still many farmers who do not receive advice and many technologies and approaches that farmers could adopt to improve their productivity. But expanding in-person extension to reach more people may be challenging for many low and middle income countries because with in-person services, the cost increases roughly proportionally with the number of people served. Um, and as was pointed out, there, there, there are a number of other issues as well. Digital technology has great potential to augment and improve ex existing extension services by addressing these issues. And mobile penetration rates are rising in many low and middle income countries and text and calling rates are extremely cheap. And that means that the cost of reaching extra farmers with digital extension is extremely low. Um, and there, as was pointed out, there are many other benefits. Information delivered through mobile phones can be made available on demand, can be customized to individual farmers' needs, and they can, even, they can be timed to the crop calendar or to outbreaks, pest outbreaks uh, or other specific challenges. Extension services can be tested and made more effective through iteration, A-B testing, and data analysis. Now, there are a lot of discussion of this, 
And there are some reasonable grounds for skepticism uh, that people might be concerned about. Maybe farmers don't need more information. Uh, maybe they won't change their practices in response. However, um, we actually have some, some evidence on this. Um, and from a, have an article in, uh, in Science that summarizes the results of an, quite a few studies on, the, on this topic. And what we found is statistically significant positive effects of mobile phone-based extension services. Randomized trials in several African countries have found evidence that very simple informational text messages can improve input use and supply chains and can have positive impacts on overall market efficiency. Uh, and there are studies from, from beyond Africa as well. Um, in one experiment, simple text messages increase the odds of farmers adopting Lime uh, by 22%. And because it was cheap to implement, we estimate a benefit cost ratio of nine to one. And that's fairly typical. When we did a meta analysis that pulled data from multiple studies, we found that basic messages increase adoption and uh, the basic messages to increase adoption of fertilizer, improve crop yields, and by 4% on average. This can also have impacts on, on uh, adoption of nutrition crop, nutritious crops. Now that 4% might sound modest in absolute magnitude, but let me stress two things. First, it's a very, it's relative to the cost, um, this, is, uh, this is extremely cost effective. Um, and second, you know, those are the, well, let me, three things. Uh, second, those are, are, there are positive spillover effects on others. Um, among, for example, among nearby farmers who can who interact with the farmers who are reached. And then third, and perhaps most important, there are many opportunities for innovation and improvement of digital extension services in the future, especially as smartphone penetration increases and other advances in technology become more widely available. And those could be used to address challenges uh, created by climate change, which are altering weather patterns. For example, accurate local weather forecasts could be valuable for farmers for decisions about when to plant or harvest. Uh, forecasts could be made for reasonably small fixed costs and disseminated through digital extension systems. Advances in remote sensing could enable even more customized information. Machine learning and artificial intelligence could improve personalization. And two-way communication can enable, could enable large-scale data collection from farmers to provide better overall recommendations. You know, I, on the economics and sustainability, uh, you know, there have been many attempts to use subscription models to provide digital extension services, but really most have been failures. And I think economic theory suggests that there are a number of market failures surrounding the provision of information uh, because it can be shared freely and because it's a public good. So one thing, uh, you know, I, I think there is a role for the private sector, but I think there's also a very important role for the public sector. Um, um, governments can partner with NGOs uh, like Precision Development. They can provide research support and can help implement an iterative, iterative approach to enable learning, innovation, and improvement of services over time. The key is identifying flexible institutional models that permit these partnerships to function and allow solutions to be taken to scale. Thank you very much. I'm excited to see the development of EFED's work in this area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer, uh, and thank you for addressing those issues that um, we know our audience is very interested in, uh, such as uh, the cost effectiveness of this particular technology, uh, affordability, long-term and short-term opportunities that uh, we are uh, addressing with, uh, with this technology, but also the challenges that are coming up as, uh, as the technology is, uh, is developed and as uh, penetration and scaling up are um, being one of the objectives of, uh, of this partnership between PAD and, uh, and IFAD. So now I'd like to introduce our second keynote speaker, Owen Barter, CEO of Precision Agriculture for Development. Owen, over to you. Thank you, Gladys, and thank you, Micah, for that warm introduction. We're meeting today against the background of another tragic chapter in the coronavirus pandemic. And our thoughts are very much with our colleagues, our partners, and our friends in India as they grapple with this frightening and unpredictable new wave of infections. We wish you all strength and good fortune and we send our love. 
the pandemic has reminded us that we have obligations to our fellow human beings, not only because it's the right thing to do ethically, but because we all depend for our health, our livelihood and our well-being on being part of a global community that leaves nobody behind. And we're reminded too of the value of shared knowledge as the foundation of our common well-being. Vaccination has been an excellent example of this. Vaccines are the results of iterations of scientific advances, testing and learning. We've developed systems that test vaccines to ensure they're safe and a network of delivery to get them to every part of the world. Today, about 85% of the world's children benefit from uh, the main childhood vaccinations. And it's a striking example of how the world benefits from spreading actionable ideas and knowledge quickly, cheaply, and at scale. And as Michael Kramer has just said, sharing knowledge has either very low costs or very often no cost at all, while generating huge benefits for everybody. So at Precision Agriculture for Development, we build digital information sharing systems to distribute high quality, actionable, targeted information at scale and at very low cost per person to people who, in the absence of our services, wouldn't otherwise have access to it. And we work every day to ensure that this information is valuable to the user. So we're constantly iterating and improving its usefulness to the people we serve. And we're, we're drawing directly from the tech industry and Silicon Valley in these techniques of, of testing and iterating to make services better. And we're immensely grateful for our collaboration with IFAD, which has enabled us to pursue this mission. In the last eight months since this grant was activated, we've served 1.8 million farmers with agricultural advisory information in three very different national contexts. In Kenya and Pakistan, we did it leveraging our existing systems. In Kenya, a two-way SMS uh, based digital extension system, which is called MoInfo, we operate in partnership with the Kenyan Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries, Cooperatives, and the East African mobile telecoms company, Safaricom, that I'm sure you all know. And we've increased our reach by about 75% during the lifespan of this collaboration. We're now serving 650,000 registered farmers. With EFED's funding, we've designed new decision support tools, developed new advisory content for EFED priority crops, providing information across 11 crops to help farmers make more informed decisions and more easily access information. And many of these users are beneficiaries of other EFAD funded projects, the Apatana Natural Resource Management Project, the Kenya Cereal Enhancement Program, uh, the Climate Resilient Agricultural Livelihood Project, which has been enrolled into the service uh, through MoInfo. In Pakistan, we've been able to reach uh, roughly 1.1, 1.2 million smallholder farmers via the voice and SMS platform that we designed on behalf of the Agriculture Department of the Government of Punjab. We're now in discussions with IFAD to expand these services to additional beneficiaries of the Southern Punjab Poverty, Allegi Poverty Alleviation Project and other IFAD funded projects and partners, with a particular focus on reaching women and livestock farmers. And in Nigeria, which is a new geography for PAD, we've been able to use what we've learned elsewhere to quickly build from scratch a new service targeting smallholder farmers in Nigeria's poorest region. In the past decade, the Northern states have been significantly affected by conflict and population displacement. Beginning in September, we recruited and activated an extremely talented team on the ground. Using our in-house tech platform, Paddy, we were able to quickly deploy and adapt an automated voice-based system with analytics for rapid and rich learning. With support from our colleagues in IFAD in collaboration with the federal and local governments in seven states, we brought on board an initial 6,000 Nigerian farmers for our service and successfully ran an advisory campaign during the dry season. In collaboration with IFAD, we've profiled 39,000 additional beneficiaries of the Climate Change Adaptation and Agribusiness Support Program, and we're currently integrating the results of a needs assessment survey of these farmers and onboarding additional farmers for a campaign that will run through the primary growing season, June to October. The farmers continue to seek information which empowers them to improve their incomes and sustain their livelihoods. At a time when the free movement of people, goods and services continues to be restricted, digital extension and digital information services are more important than ever. And as Micah said in her, her introduction and Michael echoed, a lesson from this experience is that we can share targeted customized information at scale at little cost. And I think it's very unlikely that we will want to go back to 
what Mike described as sleepy, more expensive systems in the future. Our collaboration with EFAD has demonstrated first that our services can be replicated, adapted and scaled in new geographies. Second, that we're able to deploy uh, and develop surveys and tests to quickly and accurately gather and analyze information from users to improve our services and adapt to evolving challenges more or less in real time. And thirdly, that the combination of governments, multilateral organizations, and nonprofit service delivery organizations like ours can deploy services quickly and at scale using local talent, shared knowledge and systems. So we envisage this new partnership as a mechanism for recovery from the devastating effects of the COVID pandemic, uh, who, which has really hard hit smallholder farmers as an investment in better ways of delivering agricultural information in the long run. There's a lot of rhetoric about the need to build back better after the pandemic. We believe that putting in place systems to spread the world's knowledge cost effectively and targeted, especially to those who would otherwise be left behind is a key ingredient of building back better. And so we hope that this collaboration, international at scale, will be the first in the development of a long-term partnership with EFAD to develop the use of digital agricultural advisory services throughout the world and to more fully integrate those services into governments, existing agricultural extension systems and absorb these services into countries' long-term budgets. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Owen. And, um... Three, three main takeaways, uh, three words, because we have, uh, we're now running over, the, over our schedule, delivering this technology quickly, cheaply, and effectively, and uh, the focus on the last mile on women, youth, and um, as you said before, also on livestock uh, uh, farmers. So now I would like to give the floor to uh, our panel moderator, Nigel Brett. He is the director of our Asia and Pacific region, and he will be moderating and welcoming our panelists. Nigel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gladys. Uh, so let's move quickly to the panel discussion. And the objective of this segment will be to hear from four experts on the key challenges and opportunities in delivering digital services to smallholder farmers. And on the panel, we have, firstly, Patrick Habamenshi. Patrick is a country program manager covering IFAD operations in Nigeria, which is one of our biggest portfolios. Next, we have Dr. Zahur Ul Hassan. Dr. Zahur is a project director for digital extension in the agricultural department of the government of Punjab in Pakistan. Next, we have Uzuamaka Ugochukwa. Uzuamaka is a country launch manager for PAD in Nigeria. And finally, we have Vivian Hoffman. Vivian is a senior research fellow at IFPRI, and Vivian's research focuses on agricultural technology adoption in Africa. So the way this will work is we'll have two 10-minute segments focused around two very specific questions on digital extension. So let's go straight to the first question. As we rapidly adopt new digital tools, how do we ensure that poor and vulnerable households who may lack connectivity and digital skills are not left behind. Patrick, let's start with you. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, here in uh, Nigeria is one of the most uh, exciting environment to be doing what we are doing now. Uh, if you look at the, the mobile connectivity in Nigeria, a recent statistic showed that about 100 72 million, that Nigeria has 172 million mobile users. Uh, in a country where we have a population of about 200 million, that's about 80% uh, mobile penetration rate. Of those 172 million, 85 million have internet on their phones. What does it mean is that the population is used to, to, to the phone is part of their daily lives and also uh, the, the internet part shows that they will use their phone not just to talk, but also to use different applications. So uh, these, these features are very important in the context of COVID because now communication and staying linked with your family in the village becomes even more important that we cannot, uh, we are not as mobile as we used to be. And it's in that context that PAD, uh, that we started this partnership with PAD that uh, Owen described so well. And it's a partnership that we are implementing in northern Nigeria, where we have some of the poor, poorest population affected by 
insecurity, food insecurity, conflicts, and all of that. So one thing that we would say, going back to that question, how do we ensure that the, the poor uh, who are, lack uh, connectivity are involved, was that we targeted the part of the country that has the, 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 more, the poorest uh, population in the country. That was one thing. But also what we realized through the implementation that not all our smallholder farmers have a phone, have an active phone, have access to the internet. So we realized that just having uh, the automated system on, on the phone is not enough. We need to combine different solutions. We need to have uh, call centers that they can call and speak with someone. We need to also look at ways to accompany them in the system, working with government to get them connected because they will still need a phone at the end of the day. Working with the uh, relays in the communities. So there's a lot of things that can be done, but the, the, the area, the, 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 the environment, the ecosystem we have in Nigeria is favorable for that. And now we have to see how we continue to work with the poorest to make sure that they are involved in whatever we are doing. Thank Thanks you. very much, Patrick. Really interesting points there on geographic targeting and also the, the issue of a combination of services, so digital and things like radio. Uh, Dr. Zohua, over to you. Thank you. Uh, in Punjab, we have observed that mobile food penetration is continuing to grow stronger year on year. This means more and more of the population has access to mobile phones. The government has decided to include more technology solutions in our effort to improve, improve agricultural yields and incomes. By using that model, which requires only the simplest phones for receiving push calls and SMS, we are confident of population. There is also considerable evidence to support the idea of knowledge dispersion through peer and network effort effects which means that even people without mobile phones may hear about information shared with their peers who own mobile phones. This and many other strategies help to ensure that we reach the poorest and most vulnerable individuals and communities. Our messages are designed to be simple and accessible even to non-literate farmers. The one challenge we have is experienced in Punjab is to reach out female farmers directly over the phone, as often the male in the household will control uh, limit access to mobile phones for women. We will continue to work on finding new and innovative pathways to reach and empower more female farmers while managing local social norms and cultural attitudes. In the project, we have uh, registered more than 1 million farmers and uh, we have uh, also registered their profile, uh, their cropping patterns and also uh, we have uh, segregated them according to their ecological zones. We have five ecological zones in the Punjab and uh, we have uh, more than uh, 50 million farmers in Punjab. So technology is the only solution. I am uh, myself working uh, uh, for the last uh, 27 years in extension department. I started a job in the extension department when there was no internet, no computer, no mobile phone. <clears throat> so I am witnessed from, uh, from the uh, crash that from the uh, grassroots level that how we developed from personal context to now ICT gadgets and ICT tools. I hope so. Uh, this uh, project, uh, Punjab government project uh, that we are working, we have now reached more than 1.2 billion farmers, but that is the startup in, in the coming years. We uh, hope that we will increase this uh, not uh, geometrically, but exponentially. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zohua. Very impressive numbers there from Pakistan. And I thought it was important what you said about the importance of um, diverse local contexts and also the importance of having simple, simple solutions, um, simple technologies to, to have scale of, of impact. Um, Uzwa Maka, you have the floor. Thanks, Nigel. COVID is accelerating digital transitions 
but breaks widening digital divide as it does so. Unequal access will add new digital dimension to poverty and may complicate poverty mitigation. Development actors must target the most marginalized to ensure that we are leaving no one behind. The development community must support policy formulation to close the digital divide to reduce social and digital inequality. At PAD, we believe that a comprehensive response to the pandemic must include investment in more accessible extension systems. At every stage of service design and delivery, we generate insights on how to serve our beneficiaries better and regularly test these insights. At scale, our systems allow us to gather large amounts of feedback directly from beneficiaries, which we use continuously to improve our products and performance. It is so rewarding to watch the face of a woman, listen to agriculture advisory services on her mobile phone, saying, Sahanu Adaya, Inkinanuma Chinkafa, Kosahanu Abiyu, Inkinanuma Masera. This translates to press one or two if you cultivate rice or maize, respectively. We are reaching people at the very point of their needs. These are the moments we work for, where life-changing connections are made at the last mile. And we're very privileged to be doing this work in Nigeria and in other parts of the world with the great support from IFAD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uzuomaka. I really liked what you were saying there on the need for effective policies to, to close the digital divide and also the importance of tailoring messages for, for women and other uh, vulnerable groups. Vivian, over to you. Thank you. So I want to first re reiterate Patrick's point that access to basic connectivity is actually quite high across most of the world. So in rural Africa, the region with the lowest network coverage, 80% of the population does have access. Least developed countries overall have 76 mobile phone subscriptions per 100 um, inhabitants. Now, that said, smartphone use is far lower. In least developed countries, there are just 33 broadband data subscriptions per 100 people. And many mobile phone users don't even use text messaging. In an ongoing IFPRI study in Uganda, for example, we found that 91% of farm households owned at least one mobile phone, but only 14% used this to receive text messages, and sending was even lower. In such contexts, as noted by Dr. Zahur, we need tools that farmers with very simple phones and limited literacy can use. For example, recorded push calls and interactive voice response systems. Now, to reach farmers without any phone access or to provide more complex information, hybrid systems involving community-based extension workers can be used. For example, in Uganda, the Grameen Foundation gives smartphones to community knowledge workers recruited from program villages. These workers can look up information for farmers and show them training videos. It's also worth noting that poor and vulnerable households are already being left behind by traditional extension services. For example, according to the most recent nationally representative data, only 6% of rural Tanzanian households had accessed extension advice in the past year. Youth and women in particular tend to be excluded from services. In Malawi, for example, Older men are 50% more likely to use extension than young women, according to one IFPRI survey. So perfect equity of access to ICT-based services will be hard to attain, just as this has been difficult for extension services more generally. But done right, digitization of extension will greatly improve the number of marginalized farmers served simply through the huge increase in the total number of farmers reached. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Again, the, 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 the recurring theme coming out, the importance, very important point of the of simplicity, simple phones, simple messages, but also the need for, for a hybrid approach in certain contexts, and also the, ultimately the, the benefits of being able to operate at scale. Um, so now let's quickly uh, move on to the second question uh, for panelists, which is the following. What advantages do mobile phone-based agricultural services present in terms of user centricity, affordability, and sustainability? And how can we leverage the pandemic response to invest in more accessible extension systems? Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Nigel. Well, the, to, to understand the advantages, we need to look where, what is, what are we comparing it to? The traditional extension services, that is 
what we are comparing it to. And the traditional uh, extension is, they are very limited in many different ways, not by their fault, but they are limited. They, they cannot travel so far. They, sometimes they travel 20, 30, 40 kilometers maximum. So in areas that, that there, where there is conflict, so some, at times they risk their lives. Uh, also, um, the, the population that are really remote will not have anyone to come and serve them. Uh, the other limitation we'll have is that all the time they are spending in the logistics of doing their work, they don't have time to build their own capacity to renew the material that they are using to, to, to provide these advices. So that's what we are comparing it to. The other element that is uh, really, um, that we see in our landscapes is that in the, the communities where we work, sometimes there's three or four different uh, uh, national languages. So when you go in the field, you need three or four translators. And one question can take one hour to translate and answer. That is what we have. With these type of digital solutions, we have the solution in the palm of your hand and it can come in the language that you want. So that is perfect. You don't need to travel. The extension is doesn't need to come to you so they can cover more people. And how do we build on what we learn? Again, let's look at it positively. In COVID, all is not negative. We learn to communicate online like you are doing now. We learn to, to train at each other online. So we need to find a way to build that in our project. So it's not just a solution for COVID for a given time, but it's something that we are doing permanently. We will be investing in the skills for the extensionists and the users. We build in the technology and also we build in uh, our relations with government so they can support us in implementing this transformation. And one last thing that I wanted to say again about Nigeria is that more, almost 50% of the population is less than 15 years old. So what we will have in the future is that everybody will want to go digital. So we should anticipate and build that future where the youth will be dominating everything. Thank Thanks, you, Patrick. Rachel. Very interesting points, bringing in the issue of youth, but also the importance of customizing services for local contexts, local languages, and also the point you raised about the building skills to ensure scaling up. So lots of interesting stuff there. Um, Dr. Zahua, over to you. Dr. Zahua, you're on mute. Let me check. Now, could you listen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Technologies such as mobile phone based advisory have the potential to be highly customized to unique users or clusters of similar users. In Punjab, we have five agroecological zones, each with different climates, soil quality, and source of water. By customizing our advice to each zone, we can ensure that the most appropriate advice is reaching the right farmer at the right time. Punjab has over 50 million farmers. That is a huge number. And only around 2,700 government field extension workers. This is an untenable ratio, sir. Mobile advisory has the potential to be much more scalable and at far lower cost. Even accounting for the cost of profiling and customization, the cost per farmer reached as is far lower over mobile phones than in person. The current pandemic has presented a unique opportunity to rapidly deploy, scale up more mobile solutions that help limit direct person to person interaction. Such disasters can often entail great opportunity for improvements and growth what we are doing in uh, under Punjab government. Just like remote working has the, become the norm for professionals across the world, the pandemic may help demonstrate and prove the value of mobile phone-based extension services, establishing a path for the future. We have provided uh, uh, gadgets to our staff also, uh, nearly 3,600 uh, uh, gadgets, uh, these uh, tabs, and we also had developed mobile uh, applications for monitoring the staff. Also, we have developed one mobile application for farmers. So that, that can be uh, utilized only to the far by the farmers that have smartphones only. So still a large uh, number of uh, surveillance of farmers that require 
only simple messaging. So because they don't have smartphones. So we are using blended information, uh, blend of both approaches. ICT plus uh, also where there is possible uh, personal contacts, but with SOPs, wherever this is required. Then we are also sending messages according to logical zones. Secondly, we are also use, uh, we are, we have three languages mostly dominated in the Punjab, that is Punjabi, Saraiki, and also the, our national language that is Urdu. So messages that are push messages, these are normally in Urdu or in Saraiki or in Punjabi. Then in at our call center, we have IVR system. Through IVR system, these three languages are used. Then our uh, experts that are sitting over uh, in the call center, they also have potential. Uh, they are also uh, have diversified uh, background from agri engineering, from plant protection, agronomy, soil science. They also have uh, different languages come on. So accordingly, they first of all, when they contact with the farmer, they develop first of all rapport. When rapport is developed, and uh, we also have uh, uh, information re about registered farmers that what is the weather condition because our call center is ICT center is connected with multiple tools in our databases and in our uh, data center. So we identify that Mr. A is calling from uh, that station. That weather is this one, market uh, situation is this one, and also uh, its uh, uh, soil condition is this one, what should be the advice for this person? So we, are, we have devised this model that is totally customized in term of language, in term of uh, specific soil condition, in term Dr. of- Dr. Zahura, I'm gonna have to uh, ask you to wrap up. Uh, yeah, yeah. So all of this, uh, in, uh, is, it includes that uh, in, in conclusion, that uh, our ICT tools, especially these tools, uh, SMS, push calls, these, these, ha these have sustainable solution. This has the sustainable solution for not over uh, in Pakistan, for all over the world. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dr. Suha. Lots of, lots of very good stuff there. Customization, the local languages, but also the, 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 the opportunity for digital tools to actually solve the issues of scale. Um, let me move on now to uh, Uzuamaka. You have the floor. Thanks, Nigel. When delivered at scale, digital extension is extremely cost effective. Across parts programs, our average cost per farmer is approximately $1.50 per year. I think that's impressive, honestly. Digital extension lends itself to implementation during times of social crisis. For example, as necessitated by COVID-19 and in fragile and conflict affected settings like Northern Nigeria, when traditional in-person extension is very expensive and not feasible. At PAD, we conduct A-B testing, comparing two or more service design options to assess which is more effective to inform rapid upgrades to our content and delivery services. Drawing on insight from our program data, behavioral sciences evidence, and best practices, we design the best tests. We iterate improvements to enhance beneficiaries' experience, and we continue to deliver more customized information in house language. None of this is done in English. Everything that goes out from us is in house language, meeting the beneficiaries at the very point of their need. We deploy human-centered design practices that meet our beneficiaries where they are including designing for low literacy, technology constraint, and very low income beneficiaries. We see our beneficiaries as the greatest gift to us. We're learning a lot from them, improving our knowledge repertoire, integrating and sharing that gift to the world. We're very thankful to the men and women that continue to go out to put their lives, especially in Northeast Nigeria, to serve food on the table and to the community. Because of them, we continue to do the good work that we are doing. Thank you. 
Thank you, Uzumaka. And really very, very uh, important point there on A-B testing and the importance of human, human-centered design uh, focusing on, on, on low-income households. An extremely impressive cost per beneficiary, $1.5 per person per year is really quite extraordinary. Uh, Vivian, over to you. Thanks. Um, so on user centricity, one advantage of phone-based services is that information can be delivered by someone to whom the farmer can relate easily. For example, there's evidence that when women receive advice from a female extension agent, their involvement in agricultural decision-making increases. Extension services tend to be mostly staffed by men, and this can take time to change, but it's quite easy to send farmers voice or even video recordings by a trainer of the same gender. The same approach could be used for other marginalized populations, such as ethnic or religious minorities. Affordability is one of the main selling points of phone-based agricultural services, and the evidence on this is striking. In Kenya, the cost of getting farmers to experiment with adding lime to their soil is about 250 times lower using a phone-based approach compared to traditional extension methods. Now, finally, on pandemic response, COVID restrictions have forced innovation in ICT-based extension services, as well as agricultural input markets and output markets. To fully leverage the opportunity to invest in more accessible extension systems going forward, two things seem important to me. First, organizations providing extension, especially governments, should be linked up with the best digital service providers available to ensure that implementation of phone-based systems is strong and results reflect the full potential of this approach. So now is actually the time to invest in making sure that these people have good, ex good experiences with these new approaches. Secondly, um, ideally the impact or at least the reach of digital extension should be tracked. So that we, when we again have the luxury of choice between investing in traditional in-person extension, digital services, or hybrid approaches, this evidence can be used to inform decisions and make budgets go as far as they possibly can. Great points, Vivian, especially on um, well, how, the, how the phone service can be tailored to better serve women and, and other marginalized groups, um, but also on the very low cost compared to traditional extension and the need to, to keep working on the evidence base. Um, Okay, I, I think um, with that, I think we can bring the, the panel discussion segment to a close. So let me, let me pass the floor back to Gladys who will continue with the Q&A session. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Nigel. We have literally the Q&A on fire. That was a very insightful and thought-provoking panel dialogue. Thank you very much to everyone for uh, all your inputs. So. Uh, let me go quickly to the top of our uh, Q&A box. I see that Mike would like to address one of the questions. It's from Alessandro Marini. And Alessandro is asking, as for traditional extension system, agricultural extension alone, without access to other services, such as financial services and market access, may not actually make a difference for small, uh, smallholder farmers. The real groundbreaking opportunity of digital services is to interlock extension with market platforms and access to financial services. Can we hear from the panelists on experience and research in combining these three elements uh, in markets? Maike? Yeah, thanks very much. And I think this is a very rich uh, discussion. Um, first of all, it should, of course, be, uh, be a given that just providing knowledge to farmers without financing uh, and without market access will not make a difference. So um, this is a cheaper solution, but let's not count ourselves rich that it's a, it's a silver bullet or it solves everything. Um, in my opening remarks, I talked about the business models that we will see going forward. And I think this question points to the need that together with partners, including uh, Precision Agriculture for, uh, for Development and EFRI and others, we need to actually invest in this. We don't know how this market is going to be structured in the future. Will you have one service provider that actually combines financial information, agriculture information, market access information, and, and brings together financiers, markets, and, and know-how with farmers, or is there different streams? I think on the one hand, um, these, these, there's an efficiency argument to combine these, um, these services, um, but I think we need to be careful here um, because I think it's also quite dangerous that you create new monopolies in the market 
or that a trusted source of information that's trusted by the farmer um, for objective information becomes a peddler of services from banks, from input providers, or from, uh, from, uh, from market parties. So I think this is the next step uh, in uh, the research and the learning we need to do together. Um, we all know how fraught uh, the development of uh, digital services in general has been in the past few years with new market forces coming up. Let's learn from that and get it right in uh, the space of digital agricultural services. Thank you so much, Maike. Uh, I would like now to move on to the next question. It's from Rewa, Rewa Misra. Does the digital platform respond to individual needs of smallholder farmers or simply broadcasts general information? In other words, does the app provide feedback services to farmers? Uh, Owen, I believe you want to address this question. Thanks, Gladys. Yeah, and, and thanks for the great question. I, I think this is one of the real differences of the new digital platforms is, is moving away from the idea of a one size fits all broadcast of information um, in several respects. But one is customizing information that is relevant to a particular farmer. If you know what crop they're growing, if you know what kind of land they're on, um, if you know whether they have um, irrigation or not, um, you're able to target them with information that's specific to their needs. And we're exploring, um, to the previous point, things like being able to tell people where in their neighborhood they can buy the inputs that they need most cheaply. So connecting them to input suppliers or perhaps connecting them to um, uh, people who can buy, who, you know, um, uh, people who can buy their product and so on. So that in, in that sense, it's customized and targeted uh, to, the, to the individual circumstances of, of the person you're reaching. Um, but, uh, but also, uh, as Uzo Marka was emphasizing, we are learning all the time from our farmers about what questions they want answered. Um, we're learning from them about their priorities. Uh, we're, we're learning from them about solutions that work in their, uh, in their areas. And we're, we're exploring how we become a platform, not for us transmitting information top down, but for ensuring that best practice and knowledge is spread through the communities uh, where we're working. And so, um, it, it's very much uh, targeted, uh, customized, local, and of course that's possible at scale with digital applications in a way that's just not possible at scale with in-person services. And, and it, in many ways what we're doing is drawing on what tech firms do uh, in, in, custom, in targeting and customizing and, and making their services useful by really serving the individual needs of the individual users. And, and so we're, we're trying to bring to international development, and in this case, smallholder farmers, something that is widely used in other contexts. Thank you so much, Owen. Uh, moving on to the next question. It's um, from Katinka Duel. She's asking, a recent GSMA report shows the mobile gender gap in Pakistan. Women stated that fear of family disapproval is the main reason they do not have a phone. Is there a way to reach these women and give them access? Who'd like to address this question? I'll take this question. Thank you, Zomaka. So much. At PAD, we've come to realize that clothing, closing the mobile phone gender gap will require addressing more than one issue, social, financial, and educational barriers. Now, we understand that this gender gap are usually attributed to a number of factors like cost of the device, coverage, concerns for security, safety. We have come to organize and understand how this works better. And to that end, what we have used is to time messages to reach more women. We also tailor content that specifically address women. At PAD and in collaboration with IFAD, we specifically encourage agricultural value chain that are sensitive to women, that more women tend to plant. And we've also learned to change the gender of the voice push calls that they receive. So sometimes push calls are sent more often in female than in the male gendered voice, just to get more engagement and gradually over time reduce those barriers. We have seen that traditional in-person agriculture extension is more likely to exclude women, but with digital extension services, it is more inclusive to women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uzumaka. I don't know if anyone else wants to contribute to that uh, to that response. Uh, so, thank you, Vivian. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if a woman doesn't have access to a phone at all, it's going to be hard to reach her through a phone. And in those cases, you will need a hybrid model where maybe there's somebody in the community who's trained or incentivized in some way. So if somebody has a smartphone um, and you can send them a payment if they go and train some some other people in the village and that sort of approach. And hopefully there's a woman with a smartphone um, or a woman whose husband has a smartphone who can be encouraged to do this sort of thing and kind of bring that reach out further to those users who wouldn't otherwise have have access. So I think there's ways, but you need to be creative about it. Yeah, thank you, Vivian. Yeah, we did discuss the hybrid model before, and, and I agree with you. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from uh, Merdata Puya. She's asking, or he's asking, how we can encourage social media owners like Facebook, for instance, to develop and introduce specific social media for farmers as their social responsibility. Um, she cites, or he cites some examples, and um, who would like to address this question? Well, I, let me try and, uh, and answer Thank that you, Patrick. one. <laughs> Thank you. I think what we need to do uh, before we get social networks to adopt some of these community rules that we would like to see happening is to create that community online. We are talking here about digital platforms. So we are the perfect person to be doing, uh, to be having more of a presence online. So when there is a community on social networks, the social ne networks are se more sensitive to the need of that community. But this community that we are talking about that might have uh, difficulty accessing uh, our services, uh, they are likely not on, on social networks if they cannot even access basic services. So we need to create that presence. And then from that presence, we can try to, to, to make the do, to impart those changes that we would like to see in terms of how the, the social networks approach that. Now the social networks also have some social corporate responsibility. We can look into that and see if those are aspects that they are covering in our respective uh, regions uh, and, uh, and talk to them um, on, that, uh, on that aspect. So it would be like two, two angles uh, at which we can look this problem, at this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I see Dr. Zahur would like to address that and then yeah, Owen. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add a few of my experiences or observations about this. Uh, first of all, uh, there is general perception if, or stereotyping about uh, being a villager or being a farmer among the policymakers or the people living in uh, urban areas. Uh, so first of all, that impression and that impression is also is uh, normally moved on in our media, in our programs, uh, movies, whatsoever is that also has impact. So first of all, we should uh, uh, come up with the strong now evidence that during pandemic, only food security has saved this planet because otherwise you are, all the businesses were closed, but food uh, farmer was doing his or her business. First, this is, uh, after this, then we should have take up policy makers and also regulators that they also give some portion of time in the channels that uh, likewise that 20% or 5% 10% on daily basis to agriculture, to food security. Then, or, uh, then this should also be through legislation. Uh, first of all, we will have to do lobbying for policymakers, for regulators. Then this will be, uh, this will move on to the owners of social media. But for the time being, no doubt, different groups are uh, planning, doing. But, uh, so this is my uh, addition to this question. Uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Zahur. Owen, if you can just uh, 15 seconds, because we have run out of time and we still have one more item in our agenda. Uh, just to say that many farmers are using social media platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook already. Uh, and uh, one one issue is how we how we support that and and uh, help that help this along. Yeah, exactly. And then I think that there are also there are other issues related to data privacy and data protection of farmers that uh, you know uh, we need to address as well. So there are many questions that we still haven't answered in the Q and A, but uh, we will be producing as 
I said before, a Q&A report addressing any questions that were not answered during this live session. So please uh, bear with us. We will be sharing those via email with everybody that has registered to do to today's event. I would like to now give time to our um, scenographer so that we can move to the next session and welcome our Associate Vice President of the Program Management Department, uh, Donald Brown. Thanks, Gladys. Donald, the floor is yours. Just, just one second while we set the scene. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead, Donald. Great, thanks uh, Gladys and good morning, afternoon and evening to everybody. Um, uh, it's difficult to do justice to the conversation that we've just had today and I'm sure we could have spent a day or a week on this. I mean, it's not only fascinating, but extremely important and important for particularly the lives of the small farmers uh, that we've been talking about. But first, I'd just like to thank uh, the keynote speakers, uh, the panelists, the participants, the moderator and the organizers. I thought the questions coming up in the Q&A are fantastic and, and, and it's great that we'll produce a written response to them. I mean, it's clear from the conversation that even before COVID, uh, small uh, smallholder farmers, uh, particularly poor ones, were had had a lack of access to information to services, and COVID has made that worse. Um, and, but I think it's also clear that uh, COVID is an opportunity, and I think, as one of the speakers said, to build back better. Um, and that uh, digital agricultural digital services have great potential, um, and particularly for small rural uh, poor farmers, and also to target the, divide, the, the, the diverse needs of different population groups. Uh, we've heard a bit about gender, we've heard a bit about uh, language issues, but also about very different contexts. Uh, and so, you know what you can do is really tailor content to context and, and to the target audience and it's clear that there are incredible economies of scale uh, and value for money in, in using uh, digital services but one of the things that really struck me today was this issue about simplicity um, you know that we shouldn't be reaching for the, the sort of high tech end of it that very very often you know, we have to be planning for 2G services and 3G networks. Uh, you know, we spend our entire life thinking about 4G and 5G, but actually it needs to be down at the bottom end of it. And, and the importance of things of just, you know, basic SMS uh, messaging and voice messaging, because actually many people have very simple handsets. The importance of literacy, the importance of local languages, really important issues. We, you know, we heard some really good examples of partnerships that are going on out there, partnerships between EFAD and PAD, but I noticed in the chat many, many other partnerships going on. EFAD has also got other programs going on in the Pacific, in, in South America, that we'd be happy to share. Um, the other point that, uh, that, that struck me very much is that, that there is kind of a policy question here, and I think a number of people touched on it, you know, what do we need now from uh, national extension systems? You know, uh, is, it, is it the same as we've had before? Is it that they get replaced by newer ICT versions? Or is it that we need to complement the two together? And if so, what does that look like and, and for whom? Uh, we haven't had a chance really to explore that side of it, but I think it'd be really, really interesting to explore, you know, are these complementary? Are they... Should they be uh, replacing uh, uh, these traditional systems or not? And that would be great. Um, and, and how do we better target? But just lastly, EFAD is very committed on this agenda. Um, and, and going forward, we very much want to put ICT for development uh, and, and digital agricultural services at the centre of our work, because clearly with the global reach and the global programmes EFAD have, this is such an important issue to get knowledge and information to farmers. This must be at the center of the work we can do of taking it to scale. So with that, I'd like to close today and thank everyone very much for their participation. Back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Donald. Before we say goodbye, I would like to invite everyone to our next IFAD Innovation Talk. We will be talking about how to deliver agile and sustainable procurement 
through innovative approaches. As you know, procurement is a key factor, a key element in innovation. So we will be addressing that with our colleagues from uh, the multilateral development banks and that event will be run in partnership with the World Bank Group. I would like to thank now everyone for joining us today to uh, our keynote speakers, panelists, uh, to uh, Nigel for um, the moderation of the panel and for all your questions and your incredible participation in today's event. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, please send us an email to innovation at ifat.org. Thank you. Goodbye.